our friends from Facebook, welcome. We have Instagram, Facebook, and of course our friends on Zoom and YouTube. Friends, in just over a week, God willing, we will be celebrating the holiday, probably the most famous and widely celebrated holiday of Pesach. And this holiday is so dear to all of our hearts. The memories we have as children from this holiday, seeing our parents, and if we were lucky, our grandparents, and if some people were extremely lucky, even their great-grandparents sit around the Pesach Seder table, telling stories, reading from the Haggadah, drinking wine, and the beautiful plates and the glasses. I still remember as a child, my mother and father gave me a little glass, yay big, with a picture of a train, and then I had another with a car on it. These memories are so special to us. Everything at the Pesach Seder is constructed to elicit emotions and feelings, the sights and the sounds and the smells of your softest chicken soup. Maybe she had a matzo ball in there as well. Ah, the Pesach Seder. So many fond and beautiful memories that will stay with us and more importantly, our children for the rest of their lives. I don't think there's anything else in Jewish life that we do that resonates so deeply with us as children and remains with us until our old age. And we talk about our parents and our grandparents with such fond memories about past Passovers. We all celebrate together. And really, Pesach is all about the children. As the Pesach, as the Torah tells us, we're describing the mitzvah of the Haggadah, v'higarata l'bincha, speak to your kids, engage them, make them ask questions and answer their questions as best you can. It's a really multi-generational um, and multi-instructive formula that the rabbis created for us to enjoy, my friends, the Pesach Seder. And all of you who've celebrated Pesach together may remember a very unusual thing that we do on Pesach. We stand up, or someone in the family stands up. It could be a father, a grandfather, a sibling, maybe a child. And they say, go open the door. And the door is opened for a few moments. And we read some words from the Haggadah. And we wait solemnly with anticipation. And then the door is closed. And the Haggadah is continued to be read. And every child says, what are we doing? We just opened the door, left the door open for an amount of time, and no one came in. Why is this night different from all other nights? On other nights, when there's a knock at the door, we open the door, and we let someone in as a guest. And on other nights, we open the door, we see who's there, and we make a conversation. But as far as I know, nowhere else in Jewish life that we open the door, stand there for like 30 seconds, and then close the door again. And every child has said to the parents, Abba, what are you doing? And every father or mother or sibling will say, what? Elio and Navi just came to our Pesach Seder. Elijah the prophet is here. His soul is with us. And that cup, that big cup of wine on the table is his. And every child's eyes would turn to that big cup sitting on the table, watching it, wondering if the level of wine decreased a little bit. And I, as a child with my brother, used to knock the table. Some of the wine would spill out and we would say, Ima Abba! Elion Navi drank some of the wine. What is Elion Navi doing at our Pesach Seder? As far as I know, my friends, Elijah the prophet does not come to our sukkah. He's not one of the seven guests, the Shiva Ushpizin. Maybe he does, but we don't talk about it. I don't know if he comes to Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur or he comes to Purim or Shavuot. I mean, he's always welcome. 
But what is Eliyahu Hanavi doing at our Pesach Seder? And why are we stopping, letting him in at a certain point, making some vague statement about redemption and enemies of ours who still want to hurt us? And why is there a cup of wine sitting on the table full, as it should be, bigger than the other four cups that we drink at the Pesach Seder and we don't drink a drop of it? It's difficult for every Jewish parent to pour that cup of wine out. And yet, it's exactly what we do. My friends, I want to tell you a very, very important secret. And this is so important to appreciate and understand because we want and we need Eliyahu at our Pesach Seder. And we shouldn't just treat it like, oh, here he comes, there he goes. We should make the most of that moment because there is a rare moment that lasts 30 seconds every year when Elijah the prophet comes to our Pesach Seder. His soul is there with us and we're going to ask him to do something crucial, very, very important. And actually, if you look at the Chazara, the repetition of the Musaf, the extra prayer, we read on Shabbat, there is a section called the Kedusha, which is a very important section when they repeat the Shemona Esrei. And in that prayer, we see something pretty interesting. We pray to God that he should redeem us, shame it, a second time. God should redeem us a second time. Haven't we been redeemed many times? Wasn't there the whole Purim thing and the Hanukkah thing and we had the Babylonian thing and the Roman thing? We've been through many, many exiles. What is this second time thing all about? So the rabbis tell us something very important. The first exile, the first time the Jewish people were displaced and not able to be in their homeland, we were in Egypt, in Mitzrayim. And we all know the story. It makes up the bulk of the Haggadah. 70 souls entered into Egypt. And after 210 years, that 70 multiplied together with other people who joined us. And the Jewish people left Egypt in the Jewish year 2448, which is about 3,339 years ago or so from this very day of Pesach. And my friends, when we left Egypt, it was an incredible redemption. There were miracles, and there were wonders, and there were makot, there were plagues. And seven days after leaving Egypt, we stood at the Yam Suf, the Red Sea. And as we all know, you may have seen the movie, the book is better. God split the sea, allowed us to walk through by Abishan to the dry land, and the Egyptians were coming to attack us. And God gave them what they deserve for hurting us. And they were wiped out. All the choice soldiers and chariots of the Egyptians. That, my friends, was really the first ge'ula, the first redemption of our people. And it was amazing. And we celebrated that redemption with the Pesach Seder every single year for thousands of years. Your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents all the way back to that original redemption. But did you know that right now, in the Jewish year 5781, that's 2021, we're still in Galut, we're still in exile, because we made our way to Israel, and then the first temple was destroyed and we were kicked out. And then the whole Purim story happened and we went back in, but not everyone went back in, maybe 30%. And the second temple was rebuilt. And then the Assyrian Greeks came to attack us and hurt us, that's the whole Hanukkah story. And then 20 years after that, we have Tisha B'Av, that the Romans came and destroyed the second temple. But we are waiting for something. We are waiting for the third and final temple to be built in Jerusalem on Temple Mount, on Har Habayit. And that's going to come with a full redemption. And with that, say the rabbis, no more war in the entire world. No more bloodshed. It's going to be a beautiful time of divine consciousness that's going to be spread over the entire world. As the prophet Isaiah tells us, just like the seas cover the earth, so too the name of God be all over the world. We say, 
says the prophet Zachary, I believe. God's word and God's name is going to be unified. And there will be absolute shalom for all humans throughout the entire world. Now there's a prophet. He was actually the last prophet who we have recorded in our scriptures. And his name was Malachi, Malachi. And the fact that he's the last prophet, because after he prophesied, there was no more prophecy. After that point, the Jewish people were no longer a prophet organization. Thank you so much. Enjoy the jokes. We'll be here all night. The Malachi prophecy, obviously, being the last prophet and the last prophecy of the last prophet, has a lot to say about the end of days. Acharit Yamim, the arrival of Mashiach. And at the end of his writings, in the third chapter, verse 23, he says the following very important words. Hinei, behold, Anochi Sholech Lachem, Et Eliyahu Navi. Behold, I'm sending to you Elijah the prophet, Lifnei Bohayom, before the great Hanorah Vagadol, that great and awesome day. What's Malachi telling us? I'll tell you. He's saying that there's going to be a point in history, right at the end of days, when the Messiah, Mashiach, is going to come. And kingship is going to come back to the world and back to the Jewish people. And all the Jews are going to move back to Israel, which we're seeing right now, of course. Nearly half the Jewish people of the world have returned and now live in the land of Israel. And peace is going to reign throughout the entire world. That's what Malachi says. But before this Messiah character arrives, somebody is going to announce his arrival. And his name is Elijah the prophet. First name Elijah, last name prophet, middle name the. I'm only kidding. It's Eluan Navi. And Eluan Navi, says the prophet, has a very specific and important role. He is going to announce, and he's going to emcee and introduce this individual called Mashiach, who's basically going to be a king, a king who's going to live in Israel, and his capital is going to be Jerusalem, which is why all eyes are on Jerusalem to this very day. And his palace is going to be, and his temple, the third and final temple, is going to be built on Harabite, on Temple Mount. And the entire world, Jew and non-Jew, are going to flock to this individual to seek advice and guidance. And we're going to rely on his great leadership skills to bring a whole new era of peace to the entire world. We'll leave him aside for a second, because we're going to focus on Eliyahu. Because Elijah the prophet is the one who's going to announce his arrival. So this is what we do every single year. We say, Eliyahu, do me a favor. Come to my Pesach Seder. Look around. Can you see? We are still celebrating the first redemption of the Jewish people for thousands of years. And we haven't changed a thing. We still have the Matzah and the Maror and the Haroset and the Karpas and we're still leaning and we're still schlepping up our grandparents from Florida or England or wherever they are and airing them out once a year and allowing them to tell their stories from their childhood. We're going back generations. Think about at least six generations, your grandparents and their grandparents and stories they heard. What an amazing familial experience. And look, this first redemption that we're still speaking about hasn't really been completed because we're still in exile. There still isn't peace in the world and the Messiah still isn't here. And we're still living outside of Israel, most of us. So you know what? Do us a favor. We're still here doing this thing. You do your thing. Just like Malachi promised us that the redemption would happen. Boom! Do it again. As we say in the Musaf, like I mentioned, a second time. And so we are actually persuading and trying to attempt to bring Elijah into the house and say... Egypt, redemption, mwah, great, miracles, plagues, fabulous job. Oh my goodness. OMG. But there's a better redemption, and it's bigger, and it's better. So that, my friends, is why Elijah the prophet is at our Pesach Seder table. What about that cup of wine? The Kos Shel Eliyahu, the cup of Elijah. What's that doing over there? Well, as you know, we drink four cups of wine at the Pesach Seder. This, for most people, is the favorite part. And by the way, it should be red wine, and it should be a good quality wine. 
Not only that, the cup that you use should be filled to the rim and should be drunk completely. You should actually drain the entire cup. At other Jewish holidays or on Shabbat, you should have the majority of the cup or a cheek full. Malon Lugmav is called. But on Pesach, oh no, 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 no. We're celebrating. Each one of these cups is actually a celebration of four parts of the redemption. The Geula that we went through. Because God took us out physically and He took us out psychologically and spiritually. And then He made the plagues happen. And then we left Egypt. And then we stood at the Red Sea and the sea was split. And then we received the Torah at Mount Sinai. There's four parts. And for each part of those four experiences, we drink another cup of wine. Good wine. And we lean back because we're free and we knock it right back. And by the end of the face of Seder, you should be a little bit drunk. You should be a little bit high from that experience. It's a celebration. And you should enjoy it. But did you know, as one of those four parts, there's a fifth part. A fifth Lashon, a fifth expression that the Torah speaks of. And that is the word Veveti. And God brought me and brought us to Israel. Really? He did? I mean, that happened 40 years after us, but we didn't get to stay there. Some people say that fifth expression, that happened in the days of Joshua. He was the great leader who took over from Moshe, from Moses, and he's the one who brought us in. But most commentators say, no, that fifth expression has not happened yet. And therefore, that fifth expression, verbatim, that God is going to bring us all to live in the land of Israel is represented by a fifth cup. But it hasn't happened yet. And therefore, you cannot drink that cup. And it's got to be bigger than the other four cups you put on your table because that redemption is going to be bigger and better. But you can't drink it yet. Why not? Because you haven't been redeemed. And so we say, Eliyahu, look, we've even poured you a cup. As soon as you get us into the land of Israel, we'll be able to lift that fifth and final cup, make a blessing and down that one as well. That, my friends, is what the fifth cup of Elijah is doing at the table. It's his cup. But we cannot drink it yet because the fifth and final redemption hasn't occurred, but it will. And when it does, you are, and I are going to be drinking five cups. But that fifth cup is going to be the best. It's going to be the sweetest, the youngest, most delicious one. And of course, the biggest, because the biggest redemption is that one. Let's go, if you don't mind, a little bit deeper into this. Because we need to talk about someone called Jacob, Yaakov. Yaakov Avinu, our forefather, our great, 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 great grandfather, the son of Isaac and the grandson of Abraham, made a deal. And this is a deal that most people are not aware of. And this deal happened in some spiritual realm, but it's spoken about. So I'm going to tell you what the deal was, and you can make your own conclusions about it. You see, Yaakov, Jacob, when he died, was very concerned. He turned around and he blessed all his children. And he said, you know, Jewish history, my children, is going to happen to all of you. And you exclusively. Because you're going to become families and then tribes. And then your descendants are going to become the Jewish people. So every Jew that's ever going to exist, except for converts, are going to come out of you 12 sons. And I'm nervous. I'm nervous that... We're going to lose a lot of us along the way. There's going to be holocaust and pogroms and exiles. And it's going to be a difficult and challenging journey. And yet we, the Jewish people, are still going to have to be a light unto the nations of the prophet, as Zaya tells us. However, you can do it because the Messiah is going to come. So the end is going to be good. How we get to the end, trials and tribulations, that's beyond my knowledge. But that's going to happen. But I need the Messiah to come. And if I need the Messiah to come, I need Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet, to announce his arrival. The name Eliyahu is always spelt with a vav at the end. If you take a vav, the letter vav, and you put a dot inside it, it makes a oo sound. If you put a dot above it, it makes an 
O sound. Those people who know Hebrew know exactly what I'm talking about. So Eliyahu must have a Vav at the end. And yet, on five occasions, and only five occasions, do we find the name Eliyahu without the letter Vav. Happens to be that one of those five occasions was actually in the verse from Malachi we just mentioned a few moments ago. He says, behold, I'm going to send you Eliyahu. It doesn't say Eliyahu, but we know he's referring to Eliyahu. Hello? Where's the Vav? Why is that Vav missing and the other four as well? Eliyahu, the great Elijah, the prophet who did so many great things while he was alive, and supposedly when he was dead as well, who took his five Vavs? Where do they go? Listen to this. We know that Yaakov was very concerned that his children would not be redeemed. Now the name Yaakov is always spelt without a Vav. It's a Yud, an Ayin, a Kuf, and a Vez. However, on five occasions, the name Yaakov is spelt Male, which means full. And that means a Vav is put between the Kuf and the Vet. An extra Vav. It doesn't need to be there. It just kind of shows up. Now, wait a minute. Something weird is going on, my friends. Eliyar Navi, he's got a Vav in his name, and the Vav seems to be missing five times. Comes along Yaakov, Jacob, and his name appears with an extra Vav five times. It's got to be related, and it is. Let's talk for just a moment about the letter Vav. The letter Vav, as you know, is just a straight line, just like this, with a little hook on top. And the letter Vav actually means something. Whenever a Vav is put in front of a word, it means and, right? V Haaretz, and the land. Okay? Vav means and. It's a connecting word. And this. Actually, what's really interesting is there is a word in Hebrew which is Vav, which is spelt Vav Vav. The word Vav actually means a hook. Right? Vavim are hooks. And it makes sense, right? Like a hook, things you hook things with. Because a Vav connects the word that comes before it to the word that comes after it. So it's hooking two words together. This and that. This, vav, and this. So the letter vav means and, as a single letter. When you put another vav next to it, it means a hook, because it hooks things together. But even a, like a metal hook is a vav. And so vav has a few functions. It connects two words. It connects objects, as in hooking them together. And it looks very much like a finger. Hmm. Say the rabbi something unbelievable. Check this out. Five vavs were taken away from Elijah the prophet. Who took them? Jacob. He snatched them from Elijah and he added them to his own name. Why would he do that? Because, said the rabbi, something very deep and very mystical happened. Jacob, Yaakov, had a conversation with Eliyahu Navi. It can't be literally with him. It must be with his soul or his presence because they didn't live at the same time. But yet, he was able to have this conversation. And he said, Elijah, I need you to promise me that you're going to come and redeem my children, the Jewish people, at the end of days. And you're going to have to announce coming Mashiach. And you've got to make sure that unlike this Egyptian exile and redemption, where most of the Jewish people did not leave Egypt, I need you to make sure that every single Jew is redeemed at the end of days. And Elijah the prophet said, okay, I agree. And Jacob says, but how am I going to know? How am I going to know that you really mean what you're saying? Well, what is the international symbol and signal that you are promising and guaranteeing that you're going to do something. Isn't it a handshake? When you shake hands, my word and my handshake is my bond. 
deal is done. And that's exactly what Eliyahu did. He said, take my five vavs, my five fingers, and you, Yaakov, you can take them, you put them into your name. So now we're connected like two hands. And there is a handshake, my friends, that spans all of Jewish history that connects the five vavs of Eliyahu and Yaakov. It's as though they shook their hands over thousands of years. And Eliyahu said to Yaakov, I'm giving my hand. I promise you, end of days, my five vav, this five handshake, is going to promise you that in the end, there will be a redemption. But I need you to make sure that your descendants anticipate and want it. Because if they don't want it, it's not going to happen in the right time, in the right way. And therefore, every Pesach, pour for me this fifth cup. Remind me that I made this promise. Open that door. Show me some signal that you want me to come in. And you're not happy sitting in exile all over the world that you do really want to come back. And that's why, my friends, we all finish the Pesach Seder by saying, L'shana haba b'yerushalayim. That doesn't just mean on vacation in Israel, although that's amazing. That means together with Elijah and Mashiach and all the members of our family and our communities and every Jew in the entire world will return to the land of Israel. And in those days, God's name will be one. And He will be one as well. One for who? For everybody. And the ultimate peace will come. My friends, Elijah gave us his word. And he promised Yaakov, our ancestor. He couldn't just promise Abraham, Abraham, because Abraham had non-Jewish descendants, Yishmael and others. And he couldn't promise this to Yitzchak because Yitzchak had an Esav and other non-Jewish. This had to be exclusively and directly to the Jewish people, the descendants of Yaakov. And that handshake is still in play. So when your father or grandfather or sibling or son or whoever goes over to open that door for those 30 seconds, my friends, don't waste the opportunity. It is actually probably the most important part of the Pesach Seder. We're welcoming the spirit, the soul of Eliyahu and Navi Elijah into our homes. And that is our chance to pray for anything good for ourselves, our families and the Jewish people. And ultimately, that prayer will be heard. Because when Eliyahu is in play, anything, my friends, anything is possible. Okay. We'll stop over there. Thank you all so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed our journey and the five vavs and the fifth cup and the handshake that we have all become part of. If I don't see you all, we'll be having another class next week as we're going to go through the 15 steps to greatness of the Pesach Seder. I'm going to take you through those 15 steps tomorrow at 12 o'clock. Next part of my series of how to be a better version of yourself. Thank you all for joining me. Have a great and successful night. Shalom.